Uh, and like the other speakers, I would like to really thank you for this opportunity to talk to you. Um, I would say I'm in a public health school. My main work today is in epidemiology, demography, and health. Uh, but I used to be an economist. People laugh at that because I think they think of it as an incurable disease. But uh, you go, if you spend long enough in a public health school, you actually get a different perspective on things. But I'm really grateful for this chance to come back and talk to economists again uh, about these issues. And I think my experience in public health means I do have a, um, you know, maybe a somewhat different uh, view on things. I would say I would like to congratulate the uh, organizers on the title of this session on aging and growth. Because uh, I think that they may have had a temptation to say economic growth, which I think is an enormous mistake. Uh, because I think the, really the question is about aging and uh, welfare growth. We have to focus on human welfare, and uh, the economy is only a small part of human welfare. And focusing on that, I think, can, can lead you into uh, wrong policy decisions. And I'll come to that uh, issue. So an overview, I've got to reiterate what several people have already said, I think, is that longer healthy lifespans are an enormous gain uh, to human welfare. The, uh, when I learned economics, I was taught about the budget constraint. But actually, that's not the real constraint. The real constraint is a life constraint. How many, what is your lifespan, and how are you going to spend that time? That's a fundamental constraint, an optimization problem that people face. I would say that uh, it's not all positive. I think the inequality in lifespan is a big issue. And the inequality in lifespan means that the inequality in welfare is much larger than inequality in income. Because health is highly correlated with uh, income, and so the rich have longer lifespans, and so welfare is much more unequally distributed. But overall, longer lifespans, longer healthy lifespans, it's a positive story. We should be really happy. And then we raise the question, why is it a problem? Um, which Andrew talked about, and I think the problem is this should be good news. R relax the fundamental constraint on humans, but modern populations and historical institutions are incompatible. The institutions we live with are not compatible with an aging and lo uh, longevity society. And I want to propose a radical uh, point, I think, which is that the institutions should change to serve the population. That's the fundamental point I'm making. I think when I look at the economics literature, I see all these papers about what, how can we change what people do to sustain the social security system. That is a crazy position to take. Is the goal of humanity to preserve social security systems? I don't think it is. And so this argument that we have to work longer, perhaps women have to have more children, all to keep social security uh, systems sustainable, is actually a very strange way of looking at society. And I think one of the reasons why people are rejecting these policies, the public is rejecting them, even though economists are advocating them. It's not actually a sensible goal for society. A third point I'd like to make is a really important point which came up in the last talk and has come up again and again, is old age dependency is seen as a problem. And I think old age dependency is partly biological. And I'll look at some of the data on uh, the uh, physical and cognitive capabilities of old people relative to young people. I think it's a really key point. Uh, and a really key point is whether we're aging without functional limitation. But I would say most of the dependency uh, and the view of, uh, uh, or view of aging dependency is a social construct. We label the old as dependents. We make them dependents through our institutional systems. And then we say there's a dependency problem. But that problem is created by the system more than by the biology. And finally, the point I just made in the introduction is income per capita is not a welfare measure. Welfare is a much broader notion. It also has a lifetime perspective. We, we, we should think about welfare over the life course. And one of the great achievements in human society over the last century has been retirement and holidays. We invented the weekend. When I started university, we had lectures on Saturday mornings. We don't do that anymore. Fridays is almost becoming the new uh, Saturday. I think it's a great, one of the great achievements is the working week has declined from about 80 hours down to around 40. We have a lot more leisure time. That gain in leisure time is a huge welfare gain. A focus on economic growth leads you to say people have to work more because we need economic growth. A focus on welfare said that, that might not be necessary. 
And actually, in a rich society, people will want more leisure time. So I think a focus on welfare is really critical. Uh, this graph just shows the points already been made. Is it graphs the uh, old age dependency rate using the standard definition? Uh, oh, sorry, it's the working age share of the population using standard definitions as a function of life expectancy and fertility. And what you can see when you move down to the yellow line, which is longer life expectancy, 80 years, you have lower working age share. But actually, the big changes in working age share come from low fertility. And once you get down to about one, the long run uh, uh, working age share is quite low. And a lot of countries now are down at one, South Korea is just below one. So there, there's an issue about lo longevity, but it's also an issue about um, low fertility in societies. And that's changing the age structure in society. And I think we need to have a policy response, which I would say is uh, changing the its institutions. We have longer lifespans. We, there are calculations of the dependency rate which are published by the United Nations, and they use this definition, working age is 15 to 64. That's actually completely incorrect. The age at which a person earns more than they consume is uh, now is 27 in most, uh, in most countries. Actually surprisingly uniform. So most people don't become net earners until the age of 27. And they're, they're actually uh, becoming uh, net consumers in their 50s. The, the working age range is actually getting much, much smaller. And there's a question, is, are the old really dependent? And that's really a question about whether their mental and physical disabilities make them dependent. And here, a really important issue is the compression and morbidity, is that we're not only living longer, it's healthy aging, and the, the period at the end of life um, where people have these uh, physical and uh, mental uh, disabilities is actually getting smaller. That's linked to the question, uh, can they keep working? But a really big question about dependency is do these people save for their old age retirement consumption and health care? If you save for your old age retirement <coughs> consumption and health care, you're not dependent on society in any sense. You have your own resources. If there's a transfer system in place, you are dependent. And that is, I'm going to show, an institutional choice that, we, that countries make. And countries make very different choices. Uh, in economics, there's a view on age and productivity, which is this view uh, on the Mincer equation that it's really about optimal learning. And because you see retirement coming, you stop uh, investing in, uh, in learning and experience. And the economics doesn't really take account of the biology of aging. And I think this is a sort of missing link in, in economics. We know quite a lot in epidemiology about the biology of aging and how productivity and uh, physical and mental functioning varies. And that should be incorporated into the um, uh, economics literature, which I don't think it is in a meaningful way at present. Uh, this shows the prevalence of disability in the US, uh, either mobility, self-care, or lim limitations on household activities. And it is the case that older people do have difficulties uh, with these activities. And when you have difficulties with these activities, you tend to become dependent on others. So there is a biological force at he here at work. Uh, this shows the prevalence of dementia uh, by age and education in the U.S. And what you see is dementia rates go up with age. But you notice that the um, college and above rates uh, and high school rates are much lower than less than high school. Dementia is much more common among people with low education. Education levels are going up around the world. And so what we see is that the average age of onset of dementia in the United States is actually coming down. So the uh, incidence of dementia is actually uh, getting older. People are surviving longer without it. Absolute numbers are going up. But actually, dementia is being pushed back later and later, in a large part because of rising education levels. Uh, this is some work that I've done on this issue. Uh, 
And it's very hard to get a, a cognitive testing across the entire age range and see how good people are at cognitive function. And uh, so what I'm doing here is I'm using a data set of the United States Chess Federation. Uh, and this is annual chess performance by age. Uh, so this is a uh, nice thing about this data set. It's over 350,000 people uh, who play chess. And this is uh, using individual uh, fixed effects. Uh, so this is, in a sense, the within-person change over age in their uh, chess performance. And what you see is a very rapid rise in children. Uh, they get much better at chess up until about age 20. And then you get a, a more or less a quadratic. And the, uh, for the older people here, the nice thing the, about this picture is the, the peak is around age 55. But if you look at 80-year-olds, they're comparable to 20 or 30-year-olds, uh, is that it's... Um, a story of uh, very good cognitive abilities and only a very mild decline. Uh, unfortunately, that's not the whole story. Uh, if you adjust for experience, the thing is these older people have played more games and so they have more experience. That actually doesn't change things very much. The peak shifts to 56. But what's really going on here is there's a big selection effect. People who are getting worse at chess, whose cognitive abilities are declining, are actually dropping out of playing chess. And so you're getting selection towards the better players. Uh, and uh, you do a Heckman correction, you correct for the selection, and then you get that the peak is around 38, and there's much more decline with age and uh, cognitive ability. So I think there really is a, uh, uh, an issue around cognitive decline with age. Uh, the other thing about the, this is there is learning from experience. The more games you play, the better you get. Uh, but the young, the yellow line, people less than 20, gain a lot from experience. The older age groups uh, gain from experience, but at a much lower rate. And uh, as you move down to the gray, the orange, and the blue, so the over 60-year-olds gain. Uh, and they all seem to plateau at some point in, in, in terms of learning from experience whereas we don't see that plateau for the uh, very young age group. But I think this uh, understanding the biology of aging and the biological effects uh, uh, are incredibly important. There's compression of mobility. So almost every country, the onset of the age of disability is increasing uh, with life expectancy and in many countries faster than life expectancy. So we're getting compression in the disability. There are some counterexamples. The United States, after 2000, there's evidence of expansion of mobility. Uh, there's some evidence of emergence of expansion of mobility in the UK. But I think these are, sometimes, these are sort of outliers in a, in a sort of general picture. And I'm, I, I don't think they're going to be, I, and I hope they're not expanded to the rest of the world. So in most countries, we have this very positive uh, view that people are living longer and it's healthy aging. So we have a positive story in healthy aging, and then we come to the issue of um, why do we see it as problematic? And uh, this graph shows the uh, national transfer accounts, so it shows where uh, the reallocations uh, by age. And so people at each age consume and they produce. And if you consume more than you produce, you have to get the difference somewhere. So the young are consuming more than they produce. And uh, the orange is private transfers, the families are feeding them. And the red are public transfers, which is mainly uh, education. Uh, some healthcare, but for the young, it's mainly education. And it's about uh, mainly family transfers, uh, some uh, state transfers. The middle-aged are working. Um, they're earning more than they consume. And, uh, some, uh, the, uh, and the red is, means is negative. They're actually paying into uh, tax systems. And the orange is private uh, transfers. They're actually sending money, giving money to their children. And then when we get to the old, uh, the old are funding their uh, consumption uh, out of two real sources. The blue is private asset-based uh, re reallocations. So that's the saving they're doing in, uh, at young ages. They're now consuming when they're old. But the red is public transfers. That's coming out of the uh, public social security and health systems. 
And so over half of the old consumption is coming out of the, uh, these public transfer systems. And that's the problem of dependency, I think. Interestingly, the private transfers are negative. The old are actually transferring money to younger family members. They're not actually getting uh, private transfers. And, and that picture is common, I think, in many European uh, countries, that the old are in the main supported out of public transfers. Uh, this is a three-dimensional graph, so it's a bit, uh, I'm going to have to explain it, but I'm, uh, I'm going to trust you can follow it. So this is uh, how the old age get their money. The bottom left corner is family transfer. So if you depended entirely on your family, you'd be in the bottom left corner of this triangle. There's no country that is down there. Nobody's really depending completely on their family. The top is if you're uh, all asset-based reallocation. So people are saving for retirement. And there are actually quite a few countries that are uh, uh, near that uh, corner. And the bottom right is public transfers. That's a society where everything is uh, funded out of public transfers. And what you see is there's a wide range between assets and public transfers. There are some private tr uh, family transfers, but they're fairly small. Some East Asian countries, Taiwan, uh, uh, South Korea, China, have substantial family transfers supporting the old. But actually, in most countries, the money is flowing out of the old to the younger family members. But the point I want to make is that where you are along this assets versus public transfers uh, line is actually a policy choice. In some countries, it's all asset allocation, re reallocation. In other countries, it's all public transfers. Most countries, like uh, Spain, ES here, is a mix. Uh, but uh, you have a policy choice of where you want to be. And this isn't the biology, this is basically the uh, system uh, that you have. And the, and the problem of aging and dependency is essentially in countries that have chosen to have public transfer uh, systems. There's a problem of social security sustainability, pay-as-you-go pension systems are not sustainable with population aging. We see observed solutions that people suggest increase the retirement rate, uh, reduce real benefit rates, increase contribution rates, uh, increase fertility. Uh, I'm actually missing the increase in migration that we talked about earlier. So these are all ways of solving the social security sustainability problem. Uh, we've already seen this graph. The uh, social security eligibility uh, by, is going up. Uh, the age at which you become eligible is rising. And uh, I think largely as a result of this in many countries, you see old age, uh, employment at older ages among men is uh, increasing. And I think uh, most economists treat, think this is a good thing uh, because the higher employment of men at older ages means the social security system is more sustainable. But that's coming from this crazy idea that sustainability of the social security system is the objective of human life. There's actually a cost here. Many people like leisure, they like holidays, and you're forcing them to work when maybe they don't want to. So the issue is, is this the first best optimal solution? Is this welfare maximizing? And I have a, I have a worry that it's not welfare maximizing. Uh, and I think particularly if you move to the fertility issue, countries are now adopting policies to increase fertility with the goal of sustaining social security systems, telling women to have more babies because we need a, to sustain social security doesn't seem to me like a rational thing to be doing. We should be saying you should have more babies if you want, if it's increasing your welfare. But it, it, forcing people to do things to sustain is, is systems that are not really sustainable is, not a, is, is to me not a, uh, not a very clever policy uh, solution. And so we have the question, why do we have a social security system? Uh, we talked about this earlier, and I think James talked about this. Uh, the rational agents model uh, uh, would suggest we, we don't need it. People should just save privately. There is a redistribution element, anti-poverty and old age. But the real problem is people are not fully rational. And you do need to help their savings in some way. Rather than ask the question, what changes are required to make the system sustainable, I would say, what changes would allow it to mimic the first best outcome with rational agents? 
think about what rational agents would do in the face of a longer lifespan and help people achieve that through the system. That should be the way we think about social security reforms. That the objective should be maximizing human welfare, not making systems, uh, the existing system sustainable. Uh, this is just showing that if you, if you calculate optimum retirement, there is this point that um, if we look at uh, life expectancy at age 20, it's gone up. So people are expecting to live longer, and if you look at optimal retirement, optimal retirement ages go up with life expectancy. But in the other dimension, I've got the wage index at age 20. So uh, if you're richer, actually optimal retirement age goes down. And one of the things I've said is one of the big achievements in modern societies is we don't have to keep working until we die. And people value that leisure time. And in fact, over the last 100 years, the dominant force in uh, uh, retirement has been downwards, which has been the optimal response to living longer, but being richer is to retire at earlier ages. And actually, the rising uh, 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 age of retirement that we see in many countries sort of suggests that there's been a failure here in uh, improving welfare, is that we're actually having to work longer. And I think this is partly the social security reforms but it's also partly for large parts of the income distribution that have not been wage gains. Wages have been stagnant. And so uh, I think if, if we get back to economic growth, we should actually be moving to a system of more leisure time, not less. So I'm just saying, the policy objective of sustaining the, the social security system is stupid. It's, it's misidentifying what is a constraint as an objective. In economics, I was always taught you maximize welfare subject to constraints. If you make the constraint the objective, that's likely to lead you into uh, policies that are not welfare optimizing. So the optimal policy uh, may be no lower, not higher retirement age, depending on whether the income effect of hiring, uh, the effect of higher incomes outweighs the effect of longer lifespans. I do think that fully funded systems uh, uh, are sustainable. There are important problems, I think, that James raised around the insurance aspect um, in these systems and the redistribution aspect of pool systems, and I think overcoming myopia and bound the rationality of people. The, the, the uh, private market solution is not going to be very good here, so it does need uh, uh, government intervention. So the fundamental question here, I think, is do institutions exist to serve people or do people live to serve institutions? And I think economics is in danger of arguing the second way, uh, which will make it, I, I think, rather unpopular in, uh, in general society. A really good example of this is the Black Death. If you uh, want to see, if you want to look at previous examples of, uh, of policies to respond to demographic change, I think this is a really good one. So the Black Death uh, happened in uh, 1348 to 1350. A third to the half of the population died. Uh, the Black Death then ended. So you're in a, a post-Black Death world, you actually have a world of large labor shortages. This led to the breakdown of the feudal system and serfdom. What happened is, because of labor shortages, which was a new phenomena, people, uh, there was a move to wage labor. People actually started paying workers to come and work for them. Serfs would leave the land and go and work for someone else. And uh, there was a breakdown of the feudal system. And in, there was a, in England, there was a policy response, the Statute of Labors in 1351. Uh, it reinforced serfdom and made the peasants bound to service to age 68. Um, and failure punishment by imprisonment. So serfs who ran away uh, would get arrested and imprisoned. It also fixed wages to the 1347 levels. And so it has a list of wages, a penny a day for haymaking, five pence per acre for moors. And so this is a policy response which says, rather than uh, think about what the optimum response to uh, labor shortage is, uh, how do we sustain the existing uh, institutional arrangements? I think it was probably, uh, uh, had a, it probably had a very high welfare cost. And I think we're in danger of a similar sort of reaction is to, to demographic change, is to uh, 
think about how we save institutions rather than people. Uh, I do think that the, uh, we need better ways of measuring welfare. Uh, I think a focus on purely economic phenomenon in policy making can lead to uh, bad policy conclusions. Uh, I really like weekends. Uh, I think weekends are a great invention. If you really want to increase GDP per capita, uh, just abolish weekends. Make people work uh, seven days instead of five. And it just shows how crazy that a policy objective is. Uh, retirement is good. Uh, I think one of the big things is uh, valuing risk. Moving from a, uh, giving people insurance and protection against risks, particularly health insurance, but also unemployment insurance, is very well for improving. That doesn't show up in average income per capita measures. Um, so we have to adjust welfare measures of value of risk. Uh, I think we have to in include uh, uh, lifespan uh, as well as leisure. And I think we should take a life course perspective to welfare. It's, it's, your, it's your welfare over the life course, not at a point in time. And that emphasizes longevity as part of your uh, welfare. The other point I'd make is that there's declining margin utility of income, and so further income gains are much less important than rich countries. I work a lot in developing countries. I think in a very poor country, income gains are incredibly important for welfare. They're actually becoming less and less important in rich countries. And so a focus on economics, again, misses this point about welfare being a, uh, a wider notion. Sorry. Uh, this is uh, some work we did for China um, on a computable uh, general equilibrium model. Um, and I think the, this is a point Andrew is making is you have to include the responses uh, to longevity as part of the uh, model. And I think computable general equilibrium models are complex, but they're a way of doing that. And that not only includes the individual responses, but also these general equilibrium effects from aging. What we showed is the uh, introduction of rural health insurance in China had an enormous gain in welfare. The uh, equivalent valuation, the consumption equivalent was 13 percentage points. So people were going, it was a huge increase in welfare, but we estimated a decreased output, a decreased consumption, a decreased capital accumulation, and a decreased hours worked. So in all the economic measures, this is a really bad policy, but it's increasing welfare. The reason it looks so bad is one of the reasons Chinese people work so hard, work so long, and save so much is that they uh, fear their healthcare costs when old. At this time, there was no health insurance in the rural population. And so this was an enormous fear for these people and was causing them to work much longer, work more hours, and to save more. From an economic perspective, that looks good in the data, but there's a huge cost. These people are bearing enormous risk of, um, on health spending. So the, uh, a focus on welfare uh, I think uh, gives you the uh, uh, response that this health insurance was really good for China. A focus on the pure economic outcomes uh, has been, um, would, would, would mean you'd take a negative view of it. I think one of the big uh, advances in China is the move in the early 2000s away from a policy of uh, economic growth at essentially all costs to a policy that they called harmonious development. And that put much more emphasis on things like health insurance, uh, uh, on poverty, uh, not just average income, um, and on things like air pollution. So I think we have to take a more uh, holistic view of welfare and think about that when we think about policies. Uh, this graph comes from uh, Kip Fiscusi, is uh, looking at the value of life by income quintile. Um, and I think several people have done this. Uh, one thing that uh, economists do is we get these gains in lifespan and we want to turn them into money equivalents. How much is this gain in lifespan worth? And uh, what you see is uh, the rich are much more willing to pay uh, uh, for life. So this is uh, basically willingness to pay to avoid a small risk of death. And the, uh, the uh, rich are much more willing to pay. So 
someone at 120,000 a year, which is the, uh, the highest income quintile, will pay about $20 million uh, for, their, uh, for life. It's actually uh, one thousandth of that for one thousandth of a chance of death. Um, someone in the lowest income quintile, around $30,000, is only prepared to pay three or four million dollars. And we think of it, this as normal, is that there's a, an income elasticity uh, of demand for life. Uh, in health, though, when we, when we think about the uh, value of life, we, uh, in health economics, people value lives equally. We think about the gains in the life years as being equal across people, and we add them up. And there's an inconsistency here, and I think anyone who's done math uh, dislikes inconsistencies. Um, but these views, uh, the two approaches are consistent. And I think the trick is um, not using money as a numerator. So this is exactly the same graph, but what I've done is say, let's look at the value of money by income quintile. And the value of money here is what probability of death would you accept to get a million dollars? And uh, rich people, not surprisingly, are not willing to accept a very large probability of death to get a million. If you ask Bill Gates how much, what probability of death would you accept for a million dollars, his answer will be zero. <laughs> he doesn't need that extra million. But poor people actually would like the money. Their welfare would go up. And so their value of money is, uh, is quite high. Uh, and then what this gives you is, uh, if you think of the, uh, this as value of money, as utility of money in life year equivalents, you get something like this. And what this pushes you towards is taking seriously inequality as welfare reducing. The value of income to rich people is much lower than to poor people. And I think that means that uh, in welfare terms and utility terms, uh, the gains, uh, the, the losses from inequality of income are really, really big. I think economists have been reticent to, to, to take account of this, basically because we argue we don't know what the marginal utility of money is. We don't observe people's utility functions. Um, what I'm arguing for here is essentially a change in the numeraire. Is that instead of using money as a numeraire, which economists are very comfortable with, uh, we should use um, uh, life, uh, life years as a numeraire. And your willingness to pay in life years for projects, I think, is much closer to the social value of those projects than your willingness to pay in money. So when you value things, how much someone values something, I think their willingness to pay life years is a much truer indication of the value they place on it than their money. And the willingness to pay money is essentially a, 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 an indicator of your wealth rather than uh, your preferences. So uh, let me just move back. Uh, this is just making this point that there is a, was a I think that um, the story is basically good, we're living longer, it's healthy. This shows a lifetime welfare at age 60 by Dessel in the uh, United States. So we measured total welfare taking account of consumption and quality adjusted life expectancy and leisure time. Leisure time doesn't actually vary that much by Dessel. The high welfare Dessels though have both more consumption and longer uh, quality adjusted life years. And so the green line is the uh, total of these. Uh, and because the uh, consumption and uh, quality adjusted life years are so highly correlated, lifetime inequality is much bigger than point in time inequality, which is what we usually focus on. So this shows the uh, ratio, uh, different ratios. If you look at the 90-10 ratio, lifetime welfare of the top uh, uh, decile is 23 times that of the bottom. Lifetime consumption is 7.5 times higher. So the inequality, I think, is much worse than we uh, think. And I think that the, the rising uh, issues around inequality should take this lifetime perspective uh, rather than the point in time one. Uh, I, do, I do want to mention ageism is that we've been very sort of rational approaches to policy and the uh, economics of aging. But there is widespread ageism. And 
I think there is a negative effect uh, on health and well-being of the elderly. Uh, this is uh, the governor of Texas. All people should volunteer to die to save the economy, which is an extreme form of this people serve institutions rather than institutions serving people. Uh, young people have views. They, they, they can have a negative view of the old because resources, promotion. They actually dislike age-inappropriate behavior such as dancing and sex. So there's this issue that we, we can understand the economic arguments, but actually the, uh, there is pure ageism, uh, I think, as well. Uh, there is a philosophical difference with racism and sexism. If you're, if you're a philosopher, actually ageism can be ethical. If you accept that uh, you will be an ageist, but then when you're old, you accept that people will be ageist against you, uh, that could be an ethical position. And there is this fact that uh, we talked about, the young people eventually become old. They're not actually different people. Uh, I have actually talked before uh, at the uh, Reserve Bank of Kansas in Jackson Hole on um, demography and uh, uh, macroeconomics. And uh, it was interesting, my two discussions, that one was Larry Summers and the other is Alan Greenspan. And um, Larry said in his discussion, he agreed that uh, we might want people to work longer, but no one over the age of 65 should hold a position of power responsibility. Greenspan at that time was 78 and chair of the Federal Reserve, and people interpreted it as an attack on um, Greenspan. <laughs> but I, don't think th I think Larry hadn't thought it through entirely. <laughs> Uh, the interesting thing is Larry turned 65 a couple of years ago. I'd like to talk to him again and ask him if he still holds this view, in which case his ageism is ethical. <laughs> but if he doesn't anymore, then the, 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 uh, it's it, not ethically justified. Uh, so to give an overview, I think longer healthy lifespans are an enormous gain to human welfare. This is a positive development. I am concerned about welfare inequality, which is much higher than income inequality because of the correlations between health and uh, income. Current institutional arrangements in many countries are unsustainable, given population aging. But I emphasize that aging is not the problem. And I think the, the common discourse is to see aging as the problem. What we should be talking about is the institutional problem. The, the title of the conference should be the institutional problem that we have. And how are we going to change those institutions to serve a population which is going to live a long time? And the institution should be changed to improve welfare, not changing people to sustain the institutions. And in order to do that, we should change institutions, economic incentives, and social norms. I think things around the retirement age are important, not just because of the incentive effects, but they send a message about what the social norm is. And we should be very careful about setting social norms that are ageist. And, and uh, that our policy should reinforce social norms as well as set incentives. And I think I'll end there. Thank you very much. OK, we have uh, five minutes. Yes, uh, second row. No, no, here. Oh, oh sorry. first. Hey, yeah, thank you very much. Inter interesting talk. I'm sorry, I very much share with you the view that, like, yeah, longer life is better. And also, by the way, like what you talked about briefly about the fertility decline, that it's actually something very good if people want to have less kids, that they can have less, less kids. And also, I mean, in terms of like the population bomb that nobody talks about anymore, which is, you know, was a really big threat to the planet. And so that is all very positive. And so, um, but I think like when you say, you know, this is just stupid to, to uh, think of like preserving institutions and so on and, and adjusting, you know, society in, in, in that way. Um, I mean, like you didn't talk about politics at all, and I think, like in the in the short run, at least, and we have problems that we have to deal with, right? And like, it's it's good to say, oh, we should all be happy that we have fewer kids and live longer. But like, if the whole thing burns down in the next five years, ten years, twenty years, and you know, populist rising and so on, uh, it's not really a solution in a way, right? And like, no. so the question would be like, do you think is this really more like you want to inject ideas about like? we should think about the long term or is, is the next you know, presentation coming that says these are the political ways to, to deal with it? Yeah. Uh, 
Uh, there's an enormous problem here, which I didn't get to, which is institutional change sounds quite anemic. Institutional change is incredibly difficult. Uh, change, you know, the, the, um, the feudal, the king and the barons really were invested in this system, <laughs> changing their minds. There was a, actually, a, uh, was it the, the what, Taylor Rebellion? Uh, the, the serfs rebelled and there was a, essentially a civil war in Britain that was eventually put down. But institutional change, uh, uh, the, uh, there's actually a phrase in Northern Ireland. Um, when people asked you, uh, did you take part in the activities and the troubles and the political violence of that time? Uh, the standard response is, I played an active role in promoting institutional change. Uh, you don't get institutional change for free. It's very, very difficult. There are vested interests against it. Uh, there's also a point, uh, I think, that uh, if you do change, the optimum, uh, the optimum time path of change is often quite slow because there are adjustment costs for moving from one system to another. And so you may want to uh, get these changes slow. What we're doing at the moment, though, is, is not changing and basically waiting for crisis to force change, uh, which is definitely not the optimal policy. Uh, on the politics of this, uh, I, I worry a bit that the focus on, in the political sphere of sustainability of institutions as the goal actually makes the politics much harder. People do not, re that, doesn't ex that doesn't resonate with people as a sensible policy goal. If you say the policy goal is to make people's lives happier and better, that's a better policy goal. Uh, the other thing I would say is much of the policy debate outside economics, and particularly in health, is around a rights-based approach, which economics doesn't really address uh, as, as a, uh, in the policy field, and I think it should. So I think the, the way you talk about these things and, and changing the policies, but I think the, to me the first stage is academics have to figure out what the right policies are before we try to get the uh, political change. And our role, I think, is an ideas role. Um, and there are examples of countries that have put in place what I think are sustainable and welfare-enhancing policies. So it, it is possible to do. But I agree with you, the political problems of doing it in, in particular countries can be really, really hard. Uh, so I was going to ask the same question, because in this, you know, you mentioned uh, computable general equilibrium models. We know that transitions tend to take forever and they're very costly. But beyond this, I mean, when we talk about here, you kind of, we are thinking about institutions at a single country, but there's also a global aspect of this. Uh, so in the sense that aging varies across places and, I mean, we, we still don't have a unified, uh, let's say, social security system in, in Europe, uh, although there are many things that are uh, moving forward. So uh, how, how do you see the global, global uh, perspective on this institutional problem? Yeah, no, I do think there's a, uh, we do, I do think, uh, there's a very positive role for migration. Uh, I would phrase it not as a way of saving social security systems. I would say migration is good for people. It's good uh, for the people who migrate, uh, and it's actually good for the receiving country. And that is the argument that I think will win. I think there's also an issue about uh, the effect of out-migration on the sending countries. And I think we have to work with those sending countries. So, for example, in healthcare, I think one of the very bad things that happens in some places is hiring doctors from poor countries who are educated at public expense to work in, in rich countries. So I think making the uh, migration more of a win-win would be a very positive thing. But the goal of that has to be uh, human welfare, that people are better off uh, from this migration. Um, on the institutional side, I think a really important institution, which I didn't, when I say institution, I'm not just talking about governments. I think a really important one is the family. And the way families respond to these longer lifespans, uh, I think is, is very important. I think private companies and the way companies respond is also, so when I say institutions, I mean the, the whole range of things. And I, I give the example of social security. But I think all of these institutions have to respond to these uh, uh, demographic forces. Thank you, David. I, I, no surprise, that was great. Uh, and I, you know, your focus on welfare is 100% right. We have to change to seek the opportunities rather than see it as a challenge of preserving existing societies. And when it comes to health, I can't agree with you more. But I'm always shocked when I talk to health professionals. They want to kind of put it in terms of benefit of GDP, but healthy aging is just huge. But the point I want to enlarge on is your comment around retirement. 
time. And David showed a chart from uh, one of his papers on optimal retirement. And anyone who's interested in life cycle models should read those papers because there's a wonderful mathematical trick which is lovely solutions, which you, know, you now the two things are happening. If you live for longer, an income's the same, you have to work for longer. If you get a wage growth, then there's an income effect you can work for less. But I think one of the things we're going to see is that this is about when we take measure over our lifetime. And as I think state pension age increases, which it, it is obviously doing, I think we'll see more people take measure this side of retirement rather than just increasing. And I think you know, we saw Catherine's work about flexible working, changing hours. I think that could be a huge boom because we're already seeing people take more time at the beginning of life, which I think is great, but also we may see it throughout life. And I think that's going to be a really yeah, and I, I, I agree completely, and that's an institutional change that companies as well as governments have to make. And I, and I agree with you completely. I think the, the demand for more leisure, it's very odd to want all your leisure at the, end of li at the end of life. I think having leisure as you go, so longer weekends would be a good thing. And I think yeah, the, the, the issue is uh, that will lead to lower income per capita. But I think we should accept that. And it, it, it's, just, it's only this issue that you confuse income per capita and welfare that leads to thinking of that as a real problem. But I think increasing the flexibility uh, on uh, age of retirement and uh, work leisure choices during life is going to be a good thing. Uh, James, uh, short question because we are running out of time. Uh, the question sort of follows on from that, really. Um, which is one that, you know, okay, we can all call for institutional change and that's quite hard whether to even get voice there, let alone to achieve it. But there's a sort of measurement objective here as well, or there's a measurement agenda, I think. And one thing we've known for a while is that things like GDP just don't capture time mm -hmm. use. And that's just true generally, regardless of aging or anything else. And, and it was, that was one of the reasons we had real difficulties kind of understanding the the, you know, when women start coming to the labour market, things that used to be outside of GDP suddenly are inside of GDP, like childcare. So I think that, and, and you, I wouldn't say necessarily go as far as Bhutan and have well, you know, well-being accounts, but I think that if we were serious about measuring time use in GDP, um, then some of these pressures would begin at least to be apparent to central banks and regulators when they start thinking about these things. I mean, we just don't value leisure in any economic statistics. We don't even measure it. Yeah, and, I I, think, I, I, and so in some sense, I guess what I'm saying, do you, you know, that's a different kind of agenda which says we want to motivate the measurement of the economy in a way that will reveal these pressures rather than just like call. No, I, I agree. And I think, you know, I'm very keen on uh, welfare measure. But you have to measure it. I'm involved with a group of philosophers. And the problem is they want perfection in the welfare measure. Mm -hmm. And that's not achievable with, with real measures. And I think what we have to do is create a measure which we know is not quite perfect, but captures a broader notion. And I think it has to include leisure as part of your welfare notion. It has to include lifespan. I think it has to be a life course uh, dimension mm -hmm. to it. I think that is doable. It's not going to be a perfect welfare measure, but it's going to give a much more um, a reasonable approximation to what we're trying to achieve. And I would add risk. I think valuing the risk that people face as part of the welfare measure is really important. Otherwise, a lot of policies just, they show up as negative rather than positive because you're not, you're not looking at the risk element. Well, so, you, another, another way to go about it, sorry, is that, um, it, and I spent quite a bit of time over the years with Michael Marmot, and you know, his view is health is that summary statistic for everything. <laughs> so you know, his view is health is that sort of litmus test that just tells us about the quality of our life. I mean, and so it almost like he puts it as an endpoint of the measurement rather than a function into there. I mean, so the, the, the thing I'm pushing uh, at the moment is uh, quality adjusted life years, mm -hmm. but quality adjusted not just for health status, which the health people do, but quality adjusted for income. Sure. So you, you, you basically use that curve I showed to quality adjust your life year for the income level, uh, which matters a lot for the poor, not so much for the rich. So you get a quality adjusted uh, life years as a, uh, a welfare measure. Um, I, and I would include leisure in there. So there's a, uh, I think a lot of things don't get operationalized until you measure them. And then once you measure them, they take over thinking because people now have th numbers they can work with. So I think coming to an agreement on a better welfare measure um, for
for measuring uh, human progress would be an enormous achievement and would change the debate in many ways because people fall back on income per capita because it's the only thing we measure, even though mentally we know it's not the right measure. We fall back on it and treat it uh, in, in, intuitively as a welfare measure, even though it's not. Okay, well, let's uh, finish here this session. Thank you, David. Thank you.